Hi, welcome to First Lutheran Church here in Colorado Springs. I'm Pastor Travis Norton, senior pastor here. So glad that you found us online. Pray that this service will bless you. We're finishing up our sermon series on a true story, sharing your authentic faith, and just really talking about what Christian evangelism ought to look like. And maybe it's not what you expect. So I encourage you to, to follow along and see if God might be encouraging you to share your story and how he might use that to bring someone to faith. Let's prepare our hearts for this time in prayer. Father, you have blessed us with the good news of your son Jesus and transformed our lives. Give us the, the courage and opportunity to share that story with others that you might use us to be a blessing in their lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. 
The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. The harvest is plentiful. Whatever else you hear today in this passage or from this sermon, don't miss this. The harvest is plentiful. When Jesus appoints the 70 to go share the good news of God, he tells them that the harvest is plentiful. That means there are people out there who want to hear the good news, who are anxious to hear it. There are people out there who will respond with joy when the disciples come and share with them this God of love. The harvest is plentiful. That is good news that we should always keep in front of us because a plentiful harvest is motivating, isn't it? When I was in North Carolina, the church I served had a community garden, and in North Carolina, lots of rain, lots of sun. We planted tomatoes, and we got tomatoes. We got a lot of tomatoes. And one summer, we must have planted too many because we couldn't keep up with the harvest that was coming. Uh, we couldn't get enough volunteers to come and pluck all of the tomatoes and deliver them to the food pantry. And not that we didn't try. Every day, someone would come out and fill up a basket and take it to the food pantry. But still, they would have to leave ripe tomatoes on the vine. I would go out there on my lunch hour to see if I could help and, and try to get in this harvest. And every day I'd go there, and there would be ripe tomatoes that had fallen to the ground. Uh, it just didn't get plucked, and so nobody got to enjoy them. I believe Jesus uses this image of harvest to motivate us, to get us uh, anxious to go out, and to help us to see clearly the spiritual situation of our world. When we recognize that the harvest is plentiful, that people around us are hungry and thirsty for the good news of the gospel, then we're motivated to get out there and share that good news. And I can tell you from personal experience that there is nothing quite as rewarding as seeing someone's life transformed by the gospel of our Lord Jesus. My first experience of this was when I was in eighth grade. I grew up in Utah, and I was always in conversations with my Mormon friends trying to convert them. And they were doing the same to me. So it was tit for tat. We would bring our scriptures to school, and we would argue back and forth about who was right. And guess what? Neither of us changed that entire time. None of us were really open to the other side. As a side benefit, I got to know the Bible really well, and that served me well and continues to serve me well in my life. But while I was in the state of Utah, <laughs> there was a girl in my class, in my French class, named Catherine, who was clearly troubled. She would come to, to school every day. She always had a big gulp from 7-Eleven. I just assumed she'd got it on the way to school, on her desk. She looked rough and ragged, she, like she hadn't slept all night. She sat right next to me, and, and I had a, a bad habit of talking during class. And so we became friends. Georgie, why are you nodding like that? I talk in Bible study all the time. Is that what's going on? So I talked to her, and we became friends. And I discovered that that big gulp that she had on her desk was not full of soda, but was full of liquor from her parents' liquor cabinet. And I was in confirmation at the time, and I was learning about this Jesus who calls us to serve others. And, and so I, I felt a nudge by the Holy Spirit to to suggest to her that maybe she stopped drinking. And I said, I'll even pour that out for you if you'd like. And to my surprise, she agreed. And so I found myself wandering the halls of my middle school with a vodka and Coke in a big gulp, <laughs> just sure that I was going to get caught at any moment. But I poured it out, and I invited Catherine to church. And she came with me. We sat on the front row of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Sandy, Utah. She joined the youth group. And she started learning with me about Jesus. And one Sunday, several months later, she passed me a note in church, which today would have been a text message. 
And I opened the note, and it said, I opened it during the pastor's sermon, and it said, I think I'm ready to become a Christian. And so after worship, we stuck around in the pew, and we prayed, and she dedicated her life to Jesus. And I watched as Jesus continued to transform her life, to show her the gifts that she had from God, to help her to see that she was a beloved daughter of the Most High, and he sent her out to be part of the good work that he's doing in the world. Gone was the troubled teenager, numbing her pain with alcohol, and in her place was a bright and joy-filled young woman relying on God and prayer and her new Christian community to help her through her troubles. And I'm still so filled with joy that God let me experience the change that the Holy Spirit made in Catherine's life, freed her from a destructive path, and brought her into his kingdom. And when I look back on the story, I realize how very little I did. It was mostly about being her friend, talking about her questions, inviting her to church, trusting that the leaders in my church and our youth group would surround her with love and support her. You know, sometimes we get the wrong idea about evangelism, and it becomes this intimidating thing that, that's beyond us, that's for people of strong faith, not us. And maybe we get it, that idea from passages like we just read. We can't imagine being paired up by Jesus and sending out two by two out into the community to make cold calls for the Lord. But look closer at how Jesus describes what he wants his disciples to actually do. He starts with the good news. The harvest is plentiful, he tells them. He's sending them to people who want to hear the good news, who want to hear about the kingdom of heaven. Their job isn't to twist arms or close deals with aggressive sales tactics. He says, go into the town and say, peace be with you. And then read the room. Are you in a town where there is a plentiful harvest? Are you invited into someone's home? Do they sit you down and feed you and then lean in to hear what you would say? Look for people of peace, people who give you an indication that they want to hear more. And then settle in and become friends. Move into the home that welcomes you, eat and drink and talk. That doesn't sound like a sales call to me. That sounds like making a new friend, sharing authentic faith. Jesus warns the disciples, not everyone's going to be open to what, I, what you're telling them. And he says, if they are not open to it, move on. Leave them to God. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near, but then move on. I wish I had heeded that advice when I was younger. I spent way too much time arguing with people who weren't interested, not nearly enough time reading the room and saying who was interested in the gospel I had to share. I did that because of my ego, because of my pride. I wanted to show how smart I was. I wanted to show that I was a, a straight-A Christian, as if there's such a thing. There's not such a thing as a straight-A Christian. But God only blessed the conversation I had that was about genuine compassion, gentle sharing, and true friendship. When Jesus advised his disciples, he gives three criteria for authentic evangelism. Number one, be in genuine relationship. Be in community. Number two, share the good news of God's kingdom with your words. Number three, serve the people, meet their needs, heal the sick. I think all three of those are essential. You know, too often we've seen Christians who share the gospel but do it without any sense of love. They don't know the people, they don't care about the people, and so the evangelism fails to reach their hearts. We all know Christians who share the gospel like I did when I was young, out of selfish ambition and ego, eager to rack up wins but not really caring about the people. And that does more damage than good. We know people who are turned off from the Christian faith because that's been their only encounter with Christians sharing the good news. Evangelism without love fails every time. But another problem is that too often Christians serve people but fail to share the gospel. 
So people miss out on the good news of God's love and forgiveness and that relationship they can have. And this is probably what we're guilty of most in the Lutheran church. We love to quote Francis of Assisi, share the gospel always, and if necessary, use words, because we don't really want to use words. We'd rather stay silent about the kingdom of God. So we serve people, and then we cross our fingers, hoping that they'll somehow know about God and God's love, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that they're welcome into the kingdom too, that they can have a relationship with the one who made them and loves them. If we hope people figure it out for themselves, we've missed our part in true evangelism that shares with our words the good news that we know. In addition, too often Christians enter into deep friendships, have close friends with whom they never share the gospel, never tell them or give them the greatest gift that they have, their relationship with God, mostly because they're afraid of ruining the relationship by talking about religion. But by doing that, we've robbed them of what sustains us, what gives us hope and life. Why wouldn't we share that, the most precious gift with the people we're closest to and love the most? When Jesus sends his disciples out, he encourages a different kind of evangelism, a healthy evangelism that's based on compassion, on friendship, on service, and on sharing the good news of God. And when the disciples return, they are filled with joy at what they've experienced. Because not only did they see people come to faith and have their lives transformed, but they experienced God's power over the forces of darkness that come against us. They saw that Jesus was telling the truth, that the light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it, that the harvest is plentiful. It's so important that we see the world the way Jesus sees the world, not as a dark, hopeless place destined for demise, but as a place ripe and ready to experience the transformation of knowing Jesus. And we know this to be true because we've experienced it ourselves. That's what this sermon series has been about. Each one of us has a true story of how God has changed our lives, how God has been there for us when we needed it the most. Each one of us has a true story to share about experiencing the kingdom of God, about entering into a life-giving relationship with the Lord. We have a story to tell about when God forgave our sin, about when God lifted us up when we were down. We have a story to tell about a God who entered into our pain, who sat with us in our tears and our grief through his church, through fellow disciples. We have a story to tell, that the world is ready to hear, that there is hope. There is hope. It's a true story. It's unique to each one of us, but it plays on the common theme of God's amazing grace. And the harvest is plentiful. We see it at every new member class. We have people coming to First Lutheran who have been hurt in the past by churches and Christians who didn't love, who used them, who didn't show grace, but they come here and they find love and they find grace and they find true friendship. We have people coming to First Lutheran because here they have found people who are willing to enter into their pain and their hurt and hear their hardest stories rather than run away. We have people coming to First Lutheran because God is using this church to make a tangible difference in the lives of people who are hurting. And I believe we're just getting started because here in Colorado Springs, the harvest is plentiful. All around you, in your daily lives, among your family and your friends, are people ready to hear your story. And I believe God would use you if you are willing, and that matters, to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near to them. And God would give you the same joy that he gave the disciples as you see people's lives transformed by the gospel. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his field. I'm praying that the Lord would send you out into the harvest that the Lord would send you out as a laborer to do the good work of reading the room, 
finding the person of peace, befriending them, meeting their needs, and sharing with them the good news, the hope we have in Jesus. And may the Lord send this whole church out over and over and over again to the people in this city until everyone who is ready feels God's love through us, has their needs met through us, and hears clearly through us the good news of Jesus. We are already seeing the harvest come in, and it fills us with great joy and motivates us to keep going out. So share your story. God has saved you, and God would use you to bring someone else to faith in Christ. Are you ready? Amen. We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that. May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord. <music>